thanks everybody for coming, for taking some of your lunch hour or your morning, as Jacqueline said, to spend some time with us to talk about a very exciting topic, uh, permanent life insurance. So my name is Jordan Tarasoff. I'm joined by Jacqueline. I'm in Alberta. Jacqueline is in Ontario. And we're both financial planners at PWL Capital. So at PWL Capital, we are a financial planning and wealth management firm. We work with Canadian families to help them set goals and then track and work towards those goals. We do that through financial planning as well as portfolio management. Uh, one of the big questions we get often is, hey, does permanent insurance fit into my plan? Or I already have a permanent insurance policy. How should I think of that as part of my financial plan overall? So this presentation is a companion presentation to the white paper that myself, Jacqueline, and Ben Felix put out a couple of weeks ago. I think Jacqueline's gonna throw a link to that white paper in the chat. And so if you like this content, if you think it's interesting, or if you see a slide and you're like, I wonder where that data came from. I wanna know more about it. Um, all the sources are, are in the white paper, as well as a much deeper dive into all the topics that we covered today. For today's, for today's presentation, we are using a software called Mentimeter. So what that lets us do is we can interact with you and you can interact with the slides as we go through them. So we're gonna have slides that show up with questions, uh, feedback, different surveys. So if you want to go to a different browser window and type in menti.com and the code you see on the screen, or you can use your phone and scan the QR code, you'll get a little second screen where you can interact with the slides as we go through them and uh, vote. And what that will let me and Jacqueline do is cater the content to the audience. So if something shows up that is a gap, we'll spend more time on it. If something that shows up, uh, everyone knows it, not worth spending a bunch of time on, we'll gloss over that more quickly. Also, uh, please feel free to put questions in the chat. If it's a question relative to what one of us is talking about, we'll, we'll try to answer in the moment. Um, if it's a more general question, whoever isn't speaking is going to try to pop into the chat and answer your questions. If it's a big one, if it's something we need to dive into, we have some time at the end and we can go over uh, the questions together. So here we go. So to get a feel for who we are working with, as well as uh, to make sure everyone has the software working, log in and give me a response. Uh, let me know. How do you feel about permanent insurance today? Do you love it? Hate it? Are you neutral? Or are you without an opinion? You're here to learn and it's all relatively new to you. Some haters, some lovers so far. Yeah, it's a costly insurance in the chat. True. Love it when it fits the bill. True, Jeremiah. If you're joining us a little bit late, uh, the slides we use today are interactive. So you can scan the QR code down on the bottom left of the screen, or you can go to menti.com in a separate browser window, type in the code and uh, you can access it from another window. I see a question in the chat. Is it required if you're financially fit? Um, that's great. We're going to try to answer that question today. So we'll dive into that uh, required versus, versus uh, wanted, a need versus a want. All right. So there's going to be instructions to log in and interact with future slides as well. So if you didn't get a chance to get things set up for this one, don't worry. There will be other slides you can access coming up shortly. All right, so what we're gonna cover in today's presentation, uh, first off, we're gonna to try to do like a general overview of the concept of insurance and life insurance, just so we have a foundation there. Um, then we're gonna take some time and go through all the different acronyms and products that come in this space, UL versus w WL versus T100, all the different little concepts in permanent insurance. We're gonna to try to build up so we have a foundation to uh, work off of together. We'll talk about some of the myths around insurance as well as some of the ways that it's sold. We'll answer the question, is it tax-free? And in what instances is it tax-free? And then we want to talk about uh, what the insurance industry looks like. What are some of the incentives to put this insurance in place? And how does that align with the objectives of the clients who purchase these types of insurance? And, and then we're gonna wrap up with, hey, I already have a permanent insurance policy. How do I evaluate this policy to see if it's still a good fit and how it fits into my overall financial plan? So before we get into all the PERM, permanent insurance talk, I want to take a step back and first talk about what is insurance for in the first place? Like, what is the point of life insurance? What is the point of insurance? People purchase insurance when they can't handle 
the financial loss of a rare event personally. So a great example, something I like to use with clients often is the metaphor of car insurance. So if you have a fiscally responsible, reliable vehicle, like a Toyota Corolla, and you could not handle buying a new Toyota Corolla, if it was to get smashed, then you'll have to purchase car insurance. You have to purchase it anyways in Canada, but in this case, you want car insurance so that if something rare happened, a car accident, you get money to buy a new vehicle. You are made whole. You wouldn't buy car insurance so that if your Toyota Corolla got smashed, you get a Ferrari. That would mean that you're buying too much insurance. You are overinsured. You are hoping that you get into an accident because then you get an upgrade. You also wouldn't get car insurance such that if the vehicle got in an accident, you have enough money to purchase a bike. Then you'd be worse off. You would be uh, essentially underinsured. You wouldn't be able to get back to square one in the event of a catastrophic event. So very often people understand the concept when it comes to car insurance. But the question is, when it comes to life insurance, what am I trying to replace? What is the value that I want to get back if I was to pass away? And so a term that we throw around in the industry is human capital. So before I get into what human capital is, I'd like to hear from the group. How do you define human capital? Do you know what it is? If you do, how do you define it on your end? And we'll see if it aligns with PWL's definition of the term. So we see income, lifetime earning potential, ability to earn income, value of your future earnings, earnings. Perfect, ability to grow, pressure value, ability to generate income. So I've seen a lot of income here. Yes, ability to earn income, perfect. All right, I'm quite the savvy audience here today. What else do we have here? Human capital, your value as a person, lifetime earning potential. The value providing time is so you can raising kids caring opposite of human lowercase exactly. These are great. Perfect. All right. These, these are all fantastic responses. Yeah. So it is, it's your ability to generate an income over time. So when you are 20 or let's say it's 25, let's say you're 25, you finished your undergrad. Um, typically you don't have a lot of money. You don't have a lot of financial capital. You might have student loans. You may have purchased a house and have a bunch of debt. Um, so you don't have much by way of financial capital, but you have a long time horizon. And over that time horizon, you'll hopefully make money and get raises. So if you look at your balance sheet as an individual, you have very little financial capital, but lots of human capital. As you age, hopefully you are earning an income and taking some of that income and turning it into investments. So you're funding a pension, an RRSP, Canada Pension Plan, TFSA. So you're taking some of your human capital and you're transforming it into financial capital. As you age, you have a shorter and shorter time horizon over which you're going to earn income. So your human capital declines and it's being replaced by financial capital. Life insurance is meant to replace your human capital. So the need for life insurance is highest when your financial capital is low and your human capital is high. The need for life insurance declines with wealth. The want may change, but the need for financial capital declines with time. And so what we'll see is when you're young, typically you'll need life insurance. When you're older, typically you might want life insurance, but permanent life insurance is put in place to cover you for you for your entire life, not just for the time that you need it the most. And so when we're working with clients and we say, hey, there's an insurance need, typically the first thing we'll look at is what is the most cost efficient way to cover that need? So we've plotted here three different types of policies. Um, one of them is, well, I guess three different ways of funding insurance. There's what's called 10-year term insurance. So this would be insurance that's in place for 10 years. After the 10 years, if you cancel it, you got nothing. So you paid for it, got nothing out of it, but you're glad you got nothing because it means you didn't die. Um, you can keep term insurance in, in place. You, so you can keep a 10-year term policy in place, but it's going to become more expensive over time because the insurance company is covering you but they have no idea if you're healthy or not. So the longer you keep this kind of policy in place, the more expensive it gets because there's more ambiguity around your health. So you said, hey, I'm healthy when I'm 35, but 45, 55, 65, they have no idea. They need to start charging you more and more in order to give you that coverage. But hopefully your human capital is turning into financial capital. So your need is going down as your insurance cost is rising. 
So hopefully you're not spending more and more money on insurance over time. Another option for, to keep low cost coverage in place is to reapply, is to reprove that you are healthy every 10 years. So you buy a 10 year policy. When that policy comes to near the end, you go to an insurer and you say, hey, look at me, I'm still healthy. I took up running, I'm in great shape. Give me another policy at a nice low cost. The insurance company knows that you're low risk. So they'll sell it to you at a low rate versus just letting you keep the same policy and paying more and more over time. We can compare that with the cost of permanent insurance. So permanent insurance, the odds that it pays out are the same as the odds that you pass away. I don't know anyone who isn't going to die at some point. So the odds that permanent insurance pays out, so long as it keeps in force, is 100% that's going to pay out unless there's some sort of like uh, contestability of the insurance. But let's imagine it pays out on normal terms. And so because with term insurance, you're probably not going to claim, you never want to claim, the cost is very low. With permanent insurance, it's going to pay out eventually. The premium is much higher and it becomes more of a investment decision than it does a pure risk management question. So when we meet with new people, we say, is there insurance need? What's the lowest cost way to cover that need? And then we can also get permanent, but that's more of a, should we invest in permanent, not should we use permanent to cover off a hopefully temporary, temporary need. Uh, so that's a little bit of an overview on term coverage, but diving into permanent insurance, um, there's lots of ways that it's presented. I'd love to hear from the group. Uh, what do you think permanent insurance is good for? Do you think it's good for managing risk, uh, creating a tax-free retirement income? Is it good for maximizing the amount of money you give away, maximizing your estate? Is it a great investment or is it ideal for covering taxes on death? So I believe this question, you're able to rank each of them on a scale of one to five. So interesting to see everyone's different takes, different perspectives on this. So what Jordan and I tried to do here was to include the top uh, five ways that permanent insurance is typically marketed to potential policyholders. And as you can see, there's a, a variety of reasons why people think they need permanent insurance. So now that we know how permanent versus term kind of works, we haven't gone into just yet the details of different types of permanent products. What you're seeing is four different types of permanent insurance options available to you. And we'd like to know just as a baseline, if you could rank these products from highest to lowest premium payment or highest to lowest cost, what is your, your intuition? So if you did read our white paper, we go through all these types of insurance and how they differ. The permanent insurance as a whole is like this, this black box that not many people understand the intricacies of. And when I say many people, I'm talking about the end client, the person who might be purchasing the insurance. You're relying a lot on the advisor relaying the important information to you before you make a purchase decision. So our goal today is to unbundle this stuff and talk about these four types of permanent insurance um, in an easy, understandable way so that you can look at a permanent policy and know exactly what it is, um, the advantages and the disadvantages of different features on the policy. So to start, we're going to start with T100 or term to 100 permanent insurance as a baseline. So with this type of permanent insurance, we're, we're, we're talking about level premiums until death, so until you're age 100, 
or until you cancel the policy. And you also have a level death benefit. So you pay the same premium amount for the rest of your life and you're entitled to the same death, death benefit on day one as you are at age 98 or 102 or 103. So with T100, there's no cash or collateral value to the insurance. It's not an asset. There's no investment options within the policy. You're really just getting straight up insurance coverage. So when we're evaluating permanent insurance coverage options, T100 can be thought of as like the benchmark for the pure cost of insurance and nothing more. If ever you're looking at permanent insurance premiums that happen to be higher than their equivalent T100 policy, at that point, you're paying for more than just insurance coverage. You're paying for something extra. And we'll talk about what the extras are. So next we've got universal life or otherwise known as UL. So you could think of UL as T100 plus an extra side account, a side investment account. And this is really marketed as a way to distribute investment assets to your heirs or to the next generation in a tax-free or tax-sheltered way. Because what happens is on death, your beneficiaries receive both the death benefit on the policy from the insurance coverage itself. And they also receive the value of this side investment account that you've been funding, um, usually tax-free. So the minimum premium is for the cost of insurance, the fees, and the taxes. If a client wants to just maintain the coverage on a UL policy, this minimum premium is what you're going to pay. There's also the option to overfund the premiums, and you can do that up to an annual maximum. So that maximum is often several times larger than the minimum, and it'll depend on things like your age, your gender, your health. And that overfunded portion of the premium gets invested in this side investment account. So you, as the policyholder, choose how this investment account will be allocated and invested. So in that sense, you have control. And there are good and bad things about having control over that. Um, typically, the investment options are fairly limited and high fee, but you will have guaranteed options. So similar to uh, a HISA or a GIC equivalent. And you might also have mutual fund options or some of the well-known um, stock and bond indexes. So this is where you have to be aware and very careful of the asset allocation of your investment account. Make sure it aligns with the asset allocation of your outside investment accounts. Um, so when I talk about asset allocation, I'm talking about the ratio of stocks to bonds, for example, in the policy. Um, you also want to be aware of the management style of the investment holdings themselves. So for example, if the funds are actively managed, you probably want to stay away from that. Um, and also the just embedded MER or the fees on your chosen investment holdings. So all of this is stuff that you cannot take for granted and have to look into. Now, often what we see with UL is that policyholders will be advised to overfund it for so many years in order to get to a point where this policy is like self-sustaining. So you're no longer overfunding it uh, with dollars from the outside of the policy. The investment income in the policy itself is covering the cost of the premiums going forward. And that side account is generating enough investment income to keep this up. But some UL policies have rising costs of insurance, and that's the green line that you're seeing. So imagine having a volatile portfolio of stocks and bonds dedicated to covering this increasing cost of insurance. The premiums have to be covered one way or another. So whether that's from new deposits to the policy that you're making or from the value of that investment fund that you've funded for so many years, more than likely, Periods of market downturns coupled with these increasing costs uh, that are required to maintain the policy result in that policy kind of eating itself from the inside out. So eventually what happens is you're out of this self-sustaining mode and back to funding the premiums yourself to keep the coverage in place. Not ideal. So for UL, you want to be sure that first and foremost, permanent insurance coverage makes sense, which is what Jordan was getting at earlier. And then secondly, that the side investment account makes more sense for you than just a regular low cost diversified investment portfolio outside the policy. And we'll look at um, how that breaks down in terms of uh, after tax investment returns after. So all in all, there are lots of risks involved with UL policies. And the alternative to this is going with a guaranteed whole life policy, otherwise known as a non-participating whole life. 
where these risks are, instead of you bearing the risks of managing the investment accounts and covering the cost of insurance, you're instead placing all that risk on the insurer. So you can kind of think of this like investing yourself versus having a pension. So with whole life, guaranteed whole life, again, we'll, we'll use the analogy or the, the baseline of our T100, but instead of T100 plus a side investment account like universal life, now we have a T100 plus a cash surrender value. So the cash surrender value is an account inside of the insurance policy that grows over time as your contributions are made. The longer you hold on to and pay into this policy, the greater that cash surrender value becomes. Um, to give you an idea of the difference in cost of whole life coverage versus a plain old T100, $1 million of whole life for a 40 year old female would cost you about 8,200 bucks a year while the same coverage on a T100 policy would be about $1,000 cheaper. So the difference in premiums is material if we're adding this year over year. And the reason for the higher premiums on whole life is to account for the fact that if you were to cancel or walk away from a whole life policy, you are entitled to some of that cash value, right? So there's equity in the policy, whereas people who cancel their T100 policies just walk away with nothing. With a whole life policy, you can borrow against the cash surrender value. So it's an asset. You can use it as collateral. You can think of it kind of like homeowners versus renters. So with whole life, you're sort of building up equity within the policy. If you were to sell your home, you get some of that equity back, hopefully. Um, whereas T100 is more like you're renting. So if you were to cancel your policy or in this analogy, if you were to move to a new property, you get nothing. You just move to the new property. So some whole life policies are structured as limited pay policies where premiums are paid for a fixed number of years, let's say 10 or 20 years, and then the policy is guaranteed to be paid up for life. So in this case, the premiums are much higher, but they're paid for fewer years than your whole life. And when we compare it to the universal life option where you, you manage the investments to get into this self-sustaining mode and kind of hope it stays there with a um, fixed pay policy on the whole life side, you pay for a given number of years and that's it guaranteed to be paid up. So let's assume knowing what you know now, you have a known tax bill on death. What is the lowest premium product used to pay that tax? All right, people are listening. <laughs> a little bit of a hurting effect. You can see everyone else's answers. Yeah. So that's right. T100 is, is we're talking about permanent policies alone. T100 is always going to be the lowest cost option for you. Everything else is T100 plus a few bells and whistles. Mm -hmm. and, and people asked earlier, when would you want permanent insurance? A great example is if you do something called an estate freeze, where you essentially lock in the value of some shares and give uh, shares to the next generation or a new buyer, then you know what your gain is, it's all locked in. And so you roughly know what your tax on that's going to be, assuming the same tax rates. So you say, I have a known expense, this tax bill, I have an unknown date, because I don't know when I pass away, but how can I pre-fund this expense? How can I put money away such that it's gonna pay that tax bill for me? And I know it's gonna pay out on the day I die. That's where you'd use a, permanent insurance policy that doesn't really have an investment component. Everything on top of that is adding a little bit of uh, fanciness to this. There is one policy which we haven't gotten into yet, and that is participating whole life. So we try to go through this in escalating complexity and escalating features. So T100, super straightforward, pay for it, you have it, don't pay for it, you don't. UL, you pick the investments, guaranteed whole life, the insurance company promises you that it's gonna be funded up on a certain date. Um, you don't have to worry about investing. But insurance companies don't just take your premiums and sit on it in cash, happily waiting to pay out death benefits. They're going to take those premiums and they're going to invest it. And because they have lots of people paying lots of premiums, they'll have lots of money. They're able to invest in private investments that you and I as individuals don't have access to. They can invest in malls, dams, toll roads, those kinds of big infrastructure projects. They also know a lot about people who are buying the insurance. So they'll know if a 30 year old buys a permanent insurance policy it's probably not gonna pay out for a long time. So they know that all those premiums that are coming in, they probably have that money for a long time. 
they can take on long-term investments. They don't need to invest in cash and GICs and things that pay out quickly. They have a rough idea of what's coming in and what's going out. And because so many people are buying insurance, they get to take advantage of the law of large, number, law of large numbers, where if someone dies early, that's balanced by someone else dying late. So the death premiums kind of cancel each other out and you end up with something close to the average. So what a participating policy does is rather than picking investments inside a UL, rather than having guaranteed investments inside a guaranteed whole life contract, you get to participate in the business of the insurer. You get to participate in the success of the insurance company. So you get paid what's called dividends when the insurance company makes profits. So you put money into a policy, you put insurance premiums in, and you can overfund if you like, and it goes into what's called a PAR account. PAR account's a big investment portfolio um, invested in long-term projects as well as short-term cash. And what happens from the PAR account is it's going to pay out death benefits, it's going to pay out expenses, taxes, and it's going to pay out these dividends, these profits to policyholders. What's really nice about the dividends is that they vest right away. So it's not like you get a dividend, your cash value goes up, and it could go down. Every time you receive a little bit of profit, that's your new floor. So it keeps going up over time. That's one really nice thing about this type of product. And so when you look at what you want to happen as a participant in the PAR account, as a, as a participant in the insurance company's success, is you want people to live a long time. You want the investment account to do really well. And what you actually want is for other people to lapse on their policies. If someone pays into an insurance policy and then it never pays out, that means they essentially put money into the PAR account, but didn't take out the profits they're entitled to. So it ends up becoming this sort of uh, almost like a tontine where like, if you hold your policy all the way through and other people lapse, it's good for you as a participating policy holder because the PAR account stays big and there's more profits to share with the uh, policy holders. So this all sounds pretty good, right? You have this like, you're, you're buying insurance, but if, if things work out for the insurance company, then you're going to receive these profits. But what's really, really important, super important to understand is that you don't receive the profits. You receive the excess profits beyond what the insurance company expected. So the insurance company is going to do actuarial calculations to say how many policies are going to lapse? When are policies going to pay out? What is the expected return on our PAR account, on our investment account? They're going to calculate that and they're going to use that to charge premiums. If they do better, if they make more money than they expected, then they can choose to pay out dividends to policyholders. It's discretionary. They can choose to pay it out. But if the insurance company made more money than is expected, it means that they overcharge everyone who paid for insurance. Because if payouts are low, if lapses are high, it means that they didn't need to charge that much in premiums to cover their expenses. And so it ends up in this crazy spot where you buy a permanent insurance policy and pay into it. And if you overpaid, then they will return some of the capital to you, maybe inside of the policy. <laughs> so it's not the profits that you want. You almost want to invest in an insurance company that terribly overprices risk. But if they terribly overprice risk, that means the premiums are too high and you're paying the premiums. So you end up in this crazy spot where yes, you receive dividends, you receive profits, you receive money back from the policy. But the only time that you receive that money is if you as the collective group were overpaying for insurance coverage. And so people model illustrations and they assume a certain dividend rate. So you might see one company has a 6.5% dividend rate, another has a six. And they plot these projections on what the policy will become. But it's just a guess. It's just a guess at what it's going to become over time because the insurance company doesn't know how far off their assumptions are going to be and how far off their assumptions are determines how much you earn as a policyholder. So it ends up being this bit of this black box where you buy an insurance policy, hoping to avoid taxes and hoping to have a safe investment return, but you have no transparency of where the returns are coming from and why. Because an insurance company is not going to share their actuarial calculations because that's their secret sauce. That's how they make profits as a business. If everyone knew it, everyone could replicate it and steal business from them. And that's, that's, that's how insurance companies make money is by pricing risk effectively. So one more time, when you see a dividend scale, it doesn't matter. <laughs> what you care about is how off, how, how much do insurance companies overprice risk? Whatever company overprices risk the most will have the highest payouts but you also would have put the most money into it. So again, it erodes your rate of return on these types of policies. And so, yeah, just to make sure everyone's keeping up. Uh, 
these policies are often shown with a dividend scale, but the, the dividend scale has nothing to do with the actual experience. And they're often shown as completely tax-free as they grow, but the numbers shown inside these policies aren't tax-free. The numbers you're seeing are post-tax. So just because you're not paying tax on an investment doesn't mean tax isn't being paid. When premiums go in, there's a little bit of sales tax on those, percent and the insurance company isn't a charity. They're, they're a business. They're, their job is to make profits, so they pay investment income tax, and what's returned to you is post-tax. So it's not really a tax-free investment. It's tax-free to you, but taxes are still being paid at some point in the, uh, in, in the policy. Um, also, it's shown that you can take the money out personally tax-free. That sometimes applies, but not always. It depends on when you take it out and how you take it out of the policy. So let's say you funded this permanent insurance policy. Um, everyone overpaid. So lots of dividends are being paid back to the investors. The power account is growing and people are generating cash values. You have a large cash value in the policy, even after paying these taxes. Okay, now how do I get the money out of this? Uh, so there's, we're, we'll cover four ways to get the money out. Uh, one way is tax-free. You can die. Most people don't like that one. Um, but if you pass away, typically the death benefit is tax-free. It's a little bit complicated with insurance policies held inside a corporation, but on a personal level, um, if you have cash value that pays out in addition to the death benefit, it is tax-free. So that, that's great. Uh, the downside is being you don't get to enjoy it. Yeah, you're dead. <laughs> the, the other option is you can surrender the policy, which is essentially selling it back to the insurance company. So you can put a bunch of money into it and the insurance company knows they're on the hook to pay uh, a death benefit in the future. Rather than pay that, they might want to buy it from you sooner. But depending on how much you've put into it and what the cost of that policy is, selling it back, surrendering the policy uh, can be a, a gain. You, you can pay tax on that gain. Uh, you can pull out the cash value. This can, again, can be taxable. Um, and then the last strategy, which, is, which was really, really popular when interest rates were low, uh, was that you can say, you can say to a, either to the insurance company or to a separate lender, hey, like I'm guaranteed to die. I have this insurance policy. It's going to pay out a million dollars. I'll say I'll pay you off later on, but how about, you, how about you lend me some of the money today? How about you give me a loan today so that I can enjoy this policy that I funded and without paying tax? Because if I borrow today and then die in the future, the death benefits tax-free wipes out all my debts. So this is really popular when rates were low, uh, but now that rates are high, it's kind of like, uh, almost like using a home equity line of credit to pay for groceries. Most people don't like doing it. And again, the amount you borrow the loan can actually be taxable on top of the amount you borrow. So you need to go and, and get a policy illustration, talk to the insurer, make sure you understand the cost base and then borrow the money out. Mm. So three of these ways to access the funds can be taxable. One of them can be tax-free if it's owned personally, can still be taxed if it's owned in the corporation. So you see these illustrations showing this, this great growth, but it's based on actuarial miscalculations and then you access the cash in the most tax efficient way possible, given the current information. But if you bought a ball policy three years ago, thinking you could borrow against it at 2%, you'd be ticked now to see that you have to borrow at six, 7% because rates have gone up so much. So these policies often look very good in illustrations, but there is very often a fundamental misunderstanding of how they're structured, both by the clients and by the people selling them, which we'll dive into a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but to make sure, Everyone was paying attention while I ranted through our policies there. Um, do you think you can compare different insurers by the dividend scale that they post on their website and in their policy, policy illustrations? I may have given this one away in the chat a few minutes ago. Fine. If you, if you learn it three times, it's three times as effective. So it's good to know. So the point we're trying to make here is the dividend scale is um, kind of arbitrary and totally at the discretion of the insurance company. So when you get an illustration showing you a dividend scale, um, it's really an expectation of what they're going to pay out to policyholders. But when it comes time to pay out the dividend, they have total control to change it if they want to. 
We have a question in the chat. Does the capital dividend account make the cash payout tax-free in corporately owned policies? Yeah, any capital dividend account payout would be tax-free to the shareholders. <clears throat> okay, so when we consider that these participating policies have the potential to earn policy dividends, permanent insurance starts to look a lot like an investment, more so than just insurance coverage. So from that perspective, it's useful to compare the insurance with what would be the after-tax expected rate of return on a standard taxable investment portfolio of stocks and bonds, so low-cost diversified portfolio. Um, in this example on the screen, we are considering an investor who is at the highest personal tax rate in Ontario. Um, what you're seeing here is that the rate of return on insurance is great if you die right away or if you die early, neither of which I think we can all agree is really ideal. So hoping for that outcome is hoping to die earlier than you expected, which not many people would do. If we're looking a little further out at the 50 year time horizon, insurance looks great next to taxable bonds, but not so great next to stocks. And if we're talking about a 50 year time horizon, not many investors are all in on bonds and have no stocks in their portfolio. Um, if you'd held stocks and bonds over that 50 to 60 year period, you are much more likely to do better off um, with the return on the taxable investments relative to hanging on to the permanent insurance policy until death. And I also want to point out that for an apples to apples comparison of after tax returns, we have to assume that a policyholder keeps their insurance in force until they die. Um, but the reality is most individual life insurance policies actually lapse due to things like forgetting to pay the premiums, not being able to pay the premiums, or just unexpected liquidity needs where you need to surrender the policy um, and take out what you can. Now, when a policy lapses, you only get the after-tax cash value of that policy and you don't get the death benefit. So earlier on, I sort of alluded to uh, how policies are sold uh, because a lot of permanent insurance policies are put in place with a lack of understanding, both by the people buying them as well as the people selling them, unfortunately. And so why would someone sell something they don't really understand? And why would someone feel pressure to buy policies that they don't really understand? Uh, it's hard to argue with incentives. So a question for the group, um, how much commission do you think an agent earns on the first year's premium? So if you pay hundred bucks a month for a policy, how much do you think the person selling the policy makes? Do they make $300, $600 or 1200? I see a question in the chat about our uh, research on policy lapses in Canada. We couldn't find anything. Everything was US based. Uh, a really interesting stat that we saw was 88% of universal life policies don't terminate with a death claim. So 88% of policies being bought to eventually pay out aren't paying out because someone died. They're being forgotten about, sold early, uh, that kind of thing. And yeah, that's a tough question too. There is no such thing as no load insurance. Every single insurance product is sold with a commission. In the States, they have no load insurance where the commission is waived. And so a fee only firm can sell insurance and they can say, we just do financial advice. Uh, we don't want a commission. We don't want a kickback. So we're going to pick the best product, ignoring commissions. I have not seen that in Canada, even though PWL has investigated a few times. All right. Uh, so the correct answer here is over 100%. So a very astute group here. Uh, but even if you are a altruistic, uh, client-centric advisor, it's really hard when someone comes in and if they buy a term policy, you make $1,000. If they buy a permanent policy, you make $30,000. Like the differences can be that large between these two types of policies. And the way that the compensation is set up, it doesn't align the client's objectives for long-term growth and a death benefit with the advisor's objectives of getting paid and servicing the policy. Because what happens with most insurance sales is a large amount of commission is paid up front and there's a very short chargeback window. So if you were to buy a policy and cancel in the first uh, two years, then the insurance company would go to the agent and say, hey, like they barely paid into this thing, give us back some of that money. But there's a certain tipping point where the chargeback falls off. So in the first couple of years, when the chargeback is in place, 
the advisor is incentivized to look after the client, to make sure they pay their premiums, to make sure that they understand what they're funding. Over time, what happens is that there's less and less of a financial incentive to keep the policy alive, but the client cares more and more about the policy as they age because they're getting closer and closer to either collecting the death benefit or to accessing the cash from the policy. So what you can see is that someone buys a policy in the 80s, comes to a brand new advisor, their advisor retired, it comes to a brand new advisor in the 2000s and says, hey, I've been paying for this insurance policy, can I please have my tax-free money? And they don't understand that that's, it's not a panacea, it's not tax-free guaranteed income. And the person who's looking after the policy never got paid on it. So they're struggling to do the right thing for this person. The person who got paid on it is gone. And so there's a misalignment between um, the incentives of uh, the agent and the uh, and the, the objectives of the person who bought the policy, as well as the compensation structure incentivizes selling policies, not taking care of policies. And it incentivizes selling based on premium, not based on need, not based on coverage. And so I can see in the chat here, people are jumping ahead. Um, it's not, it, it's not because people are breaking the rules is because the rules for people who are insurance only are different. They're held to what's called a suitability standard, not a fiduciary standard. So if you come in and you need life insurance, there's an argument that permanent insurance is suitable. There's an argument that you need coverage today and you're going to need coverage when you're older. And so even if you're sold a policy that's too big, that doesn't make sense. The way that the structure is set up right now is that uh, it's still compliant. As long as it's, there's an argument that it's suitable, it's still compliant. You're not held to a fiduciary standard. And I saw a comment earlier that a lot of insurance is sold through multi-level marketing type schemes. So there's firms where they intentionally hire people who are new to Canada get them through the licensing exam and then have them sell these types of policies to their friends and family. This is quite common. And so you have people who don't quite understand the product getting paid a lot of money, paying a commission to the insurance company and basically uh, selling things that they don't understand to people who don't understand it as well. And, and when you're only insurance licensed, when you're only insurance licensed, if every problem, if you only have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. If you're only insurance licensed, you can't talk about ETFs. You can't talk about index funds. You can't talk about other investments. So if someone comes to you and they say, hey, I want a retirement plan. And the only thing you're allowed to talk about that has growth to it is insurance. That's going to be the only thing that you can sell them. It's much more difficult to become a certified financial planner. It's much more difficult to become a portfolio manager. And you're held to a much higher standard than it is to be able to sell insurance but your ability to screw somebody over by selling them insurance is really, really high. And so it's not malicious intent by people selling policies. It's a little bit of ignorance and it's a little bit of the industry not keeping up with people, what people need. So I didn't want to crap on insurance entirely. It does have its place. Um, it can be fa a fantastic replacement for fixed income. We saw earlier that uh, permanent insurance can have a higher return than bonds on death. And we saw that uh, it, it, it can beat fixed income on death if you don't need access to the money while you're alive. So it can be what's considered a illiquid replacement for fixed income in your portfolio. It's also good for providing cash when you need it on death. So if you do like a business freeze, or let's say you had a cottage that you wanted to keep in the family, you could have it so that when you pass away, insurance pays the tax bill on the cottage. So people aren't scrambling to come up with cash so they can keep a building in the family. So essentially the people who want to pass the cottage on to the next generation, they are pre-funding that tax liability on behalf of the beneficiaries. Uh, so it's really good for providing cash when you need it. If when you need it is when you die. Um, also insurance is great because it is, uh, it's good for privacy. So when you pass away and things pass through your will, it's contestable and people can access that information to see what's going on. If you want to have a more private estate, you could purchase life insurance and because it's a private contract, you can name a beneficiary and no one has to know about it. So if privacy is important as part of your planning or you have large fixed assets, it can be a great fit, but it's not a panacea of wonderful tax-free money for everybody. Let's screw the CRA by these certain insurance policies instead. It's often marketed that way. People who are new to the industry are often trained that that's the way to sell it, but that's not the case. It is a tool for a specific purpose, but unfortunately some of the people selling it are only licensed to sell that specific tool, not the tools that people need. 
And so a lot of people, a lot, a lot of this presentation is to say, if you're considering it, make sure you know this information. But a lot of people we talk to already have these policies, already bought them under the assumption that the way that they could access the money will be done in a certain way. And we get this question a lot. So someone will come to us and say, I've had this permanent policy for the last four, five, six years. Um, what do I do about it? And is it right for me? Do I keep going with it? How do I approach this? So the first thing, step one, we have to determine, is there an insurance need? Is that insurance need permanent or is it for a known period of time only? So I'll give you the extreme example of where term insurance would be perfect is if you have your only liability really that you're trying to cover is your mortgage for the next 20 years. You would only need a term policy for the next 20 years. You do not need uh, permanent coverage. So let's assume that we have determined that the need is only term. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna apply for term coverage. So you have your permanent policy and you wanna apply for term. If that term insurance application were to whatever, for whatever reason, come back rated or denied, you would keep the permanent coverage after all, because now that permanent policy has value. You're already insured somewhere between year one where you got the permanent policy and year six where you're applying for term, you've had health complications, um, that have made you uninsurable. So term is no longer an option for you. That's where we stop. You keep the permanent. Um, when a policyholder owns permanent insurance that isn't actually necessary for them to have, we have to figure out what the cost benefit of canceling or unwinding that policy is. So when I say the cost, I'm talking about what are you giving up if you were to cancel it? And the benefit being what are you saving if you were to cancel it? So to, to do this, we look ahead, we ignore all past premiums made, and this is the hardest thing to do, but these past premiums are a sunk cost. So if you didn't have any insurance coverage today, would you be better off buying the permanent policy relative to buying a new term policy and investing the difference in premiums? That's ultimately the question we're trying to answer. And you're better off with term if, given what we know today, given the outlook today, investing the net premium savings offers better performance than keeping your permanent policy. So the baseline assumption there is we have to in a, imagine a world where we don't have any insurance coverage, what am I better off buying, the permanent or the term? In the early years of owning a permanent policy, there's little to no buildup of cash value. So you might cancel and walk away with nothing in return for the premium payments that you've made. Sort of like, again, with my housing analogy, paying the mortgage, property tax, and maintenance costs on a home, but only getting the temporary consumption benefits of being a renter on that home. And there's a strong behavioral bias at play here too, which makes it really difficult to walk away from something you already own. So this is known as the endowment effect. And you've, in this case, you've already made the conscious decision to purchase the policy at some point in the past. If you didn't already own it, it would be a lot easier to just say, no, thanks, uh, I'll go with term and walk away. But since you do own it already, now you have to make an active decision um, to stop owning it. And you have to actively make that decision. So that's a lot harder. What makes this bias easier to ignore is to compare the sunk costs, which are hard to look at sometimes, to the long-term prospect of continuing to incur these high sometimes unnecessary premiums, and giving up the potential for higher investment returns. So in a perfect world, we acknowledge and control for the bias, we ignore the sunk costs, and we determine that we're better off in the long run with a term policy. Now we need a plan to either cancel the permanent policy outright or slowly unwind it. So um, a situation where you'd want to unwind it is where the policy has early surrender charges. Some policies have these early surrender fees in them that expire years after the policy is put in force. If you're familiar with backend DSC charges on mutual funds, it's similar in concept. So it's like a reducing scale where each year some of the cash surrender value matures and is fee free, but at the very beginning you're paying a hefty fee to redeem or, or surrender your uh, policy. So if that's the case, if you do have these early surrender charges on your policy, instead of canceling it outright, and you, you wanna use the cash surrender value to maybe buy you a few years of premium offset. So instead of continuing to fund the policy with outside dollars, the cash value in the policy funds the required premiums. And that way you can kind of bump the decision to cancel, defer it down uh, until the cash value runs out. And in the meantime, 
you have this new term policy put in place that you're funding at a much lower cost. At the end of the day, the best way to approach canceling is not always obvious or clear cut. So getting advice on this is important. Often, I know we sound very negative towards permanent insurance today, but what we have seen in practice is that a policy that might be older has already gone through the expensive years, right? So you've already kind of overpaid for so many years and the insurance company got theirs. So you've already made it through those expensive years and that policy might actually be worth keeping in the long run. And we're not opposed to that at all. It just, it, it's worth looking at in detail before making a decision. So I think that's all the prepared content that we have for you today. We have about 10 minutes left for questions. So feel free to pop those in the chat if we haven't gotten the, gotten to them yet. Um, we're also gonna share our direct calendar links in the chat if you'd like to book a time to meet with us and ask any questions that are more specific to your situation. Um, what we have on the screen here is a link to a very quick feedback form. So we've been doing these webinars on a regular basis for the last little while and we love to uh, hear what you think, good and bad. So any comment is, is welcome if you wanna click through and, and go through that. So the replay will go on YouTube once compliance watches it and make sure that we didn't say anything uh, offside. I think it was all great, but uh, we'll see what they have to say. Uh, there's a question on paid up versus partially funded for keeping the policy, Jacqueline. Uh, which que what question is it? So someone's asking, does it only make sense to keep an insurance policy if it's paid up or would it be better? Or does it also make sense to keep policies where you might've paid half the premiums and then you still have a remaining half to fund? Yeah. Seems, um, yeah. It's it's not obvious either way. So you need to determine how much insurance coverage you need. There might be an opportunity to, uh, if you don't have a paid up policy, there might be an opportunity or it may, might make sense to reduce your coverage in order to make the policy paid up. Uh, what is the highest MER you've seen in a UL policy? Are there other fees on top of the MER? Uh, MERs are usually around three or 4% inside a policy. Yeah. And the even, other the, even index out. funds can be over one. Yeah. Uh, so someone's Richard. asking, we happen to be in a strong position with our RRSPs and TFSAs filled up. Our fee for service advisor recommended participating whole life the next tranche of investing rather than a non-registered account. How would we go about thinking about this? Uh, one, one quick note is you can have a guaranteed tax-free return if you pay down your mortgage. So that's one thing to consider once you fill up your RRSP and TFSA um, with rates being as high as they are. Saving 5% is the same as earning 5%. A dollar saved is a, is a dollar earned. Um, and then it's, you want to compare the benefits of PAR to the benefits of the investment account. Because if you invest in stocks, let's say you buy a 50-50 portfolio, it's going to bounce around up and down, but you can access the money whenever you want. And it has a higher expected growth rate than a participating policy. I suspect that you already own semi-risky investments inside of your RRSP and TFSA. At least I hope you do. It's one of the big benefits to having those accounts is that the investments can be tax, tax deferred or tax free inside of them. Uh, so when you're looking at a participating policy, you need to compare it to taxable investments and paying down debt. So I'm not saying it's bad, but you need to compare it to the other things. You don't just buy par insurance because you have extra money. You can totally make it to retirement and have a successful life and not worry about money, never buying par insurance your entire life. I use this metaphor where it's like, if you go hiking, you don't just eat random mushrooms. You don't just pick them up and eat them because you saw a mushroom because it can kill you. The downside is that occasionally you'll miss a delicious mushroom that you could have had for free. But on average, you're probably better off not just going around doing this. Um, the same thing with insurance. You don't just go around buying permanent insurance because you think it's there and you should get it. Like Occasionally, you might miss an ideal policy. But on average, you're not going to get burned by buying a policy with high upfront costs. It's hard to cancel and ends up, ends up eroding your plan moving on. So to answer that, to come back to that question, compare the permanent insurance policy to investing, to paying down debt. And make sure you look at the policy at the dividend scale minus one as well. Because when you get an illustration, they're going to show you, hey, here's, if everything goes awesome, here's what it's going to return. But there is downside risk to insurance. It could perform worse than what they quote. 
So make sure you also look at the dividend scale minus one and maybe even minus two and say, hey, if I got dividend scale minus two, would I still be happy? It's important to look at. Joe Richard. Did you see the question from Joe Richard? Yeah, I have it here. So in regards to the tax-free growth point that we mentioned, is he says, isn't it sort of irrelevant that the company is paying tax as long as it is tax-free growth to the policy owner? Wouldn't it be the same as saying growth in the TFSA isn't really tax-free since the stock that you own are paying taxes? Um, so there's there's tax at the insurance company level, but there's also potential tax at the personal level, which is often overlooked. So we talked about the ACB on a policy uh, briefly. We didn't get into too much detail. Um, but that's where personal tax can be payable at the policyholders level. So it's not a blanket. Permanent insurance is tax free. The Adam, the fifteen percent tax we talked about is that tax on dividends paid out in whole life, and then you get eighty five percent. That is your dividend. Um, you never know what your dividend is going to be on whole life. So that's totally the discretion of the insurance company. The 15% tax is what the insurance company is paying on the investment income that they've earned on the pool of assets that they're investing. And then whatever their profit is, they can decide to pay it all out in year one. They can decide to pay 5% of it out as a dividend in year one. Uh, it's dependent on their business strategy. There's a few questions again on posting the replay. We, we've been putting all of our webinars on YouTube uh, for this one. If you know someone who's considering permanent insurance or someone who's been selling permanent insurance pretty aggressively, I encourage you to share this with them and uh, they can they can obviously reach out to our team if they have any questions. Uh, but I've found that a lot of people who sell insurance didn't know the things we talked about today. Uh, the YouTube channel is PWL Capital. So we have a couple. We have Rational Reminder, Ben Felix's channel, Common Sense Investing. PWL Capital as a firm also has its own channel. And that is where we've been posting our webinar replays. So we have one on index funds, uh, one on like maximizing utility, like making yourself happy by spending money. Uh, first time home savings account, what to do with my options as an employee. Lots of great content on there. All hour long webinars with lots of clips and things you can pull out to send to people. For James, yes, if you borrow against the insurance policy and invest, it's the same as using like a line of credit or a home equity or a, yeah, a line of credit or a credit card or investment loan, it would be tax deductible. That's actually, uh, there's a whole thing where it's called an immediate funding arrangement where you intentionally overfund an insurance policy and immediately borrow the money back out. And so you're basically running either all your investments or all of your uh, business expenses through an insurance policy, kind of like a Smith maneuver. Getting kind of jargony here, but you like, you're running everything through an insurance policy, building up this giant loan that's tax deductible over time, and then relying on the death benefit, paying you in excess beyond what the immediate financing costs were. Um, they look great in spreadsheets, but they don't look great if business operations stall or interest rates become humongous, those kinds of things. So it's always important to consider those risks. And then uh, Carlo, I see, I see a great question. One way insurance is sold is that it, it's not correlated with the markets. So I mentioned earlier that when you receive a dividend, it vests immediately and your cash value increases. So if the stock market tanks 40%, your dividends aren't going to go down. So it does have value in that capacity where you have a non-correlated asset. So if markets go down, you would borrow against the insurance policy. If markets go up, then you would spend from the portfolio. So essentially you're using the insurance like a cash buffer in your portfolio. Uh, but there's some interesting research as well that rebalancing does basically the same thing. And so when you're swapping a portfolio for either cash or insurance, you're swapping a higher performing asset for a lower performing asset. And if markets had a tendency to go down, you'd be better off. But because they have a tendency to go up, you end up worse off over longer periods of time. There's a great uh, Michael Kitz's article on the, uh, the cash wedge strategy, but the same thing applies for insurance. So it can make sense. I would argue you have to be very, very wealthy to do it because it's, it's a liquid, hard to access. You have to have extra taxable money that you want to put towards this type of strategy. IFA, IRP. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, IRP is, is the whole like funded insurance policy, borrow against it, it's gonna be tax-free uh, pitch.
that we've seen. There's also a cur corporate insured retirement plan. That's way more complicated. Um, that can make sense because the taxation of corporations, but we decided to skip that for today. So if you do have more questions, you kind of run out of time today. But if you have more questions, there's a link to book a time with us through this feedback form. Um, if you'd like to chat more, we're happy to chat with, with anyone who attended today. Thanks everyone for your time.